I become a woman, I will not be accepted by the society because I was born as a boy and I will be exploited by the society and the society will not only reject me but it will also destroy me. That was their worry. But they did not hate me. My parents did not hate me. They wanted to help me. But they don't know how. So they first took me to a doctor. Something was wrong with my body. And in India, 15 to 20 years ago, the doctors were not aware of gender dysphoria. So my doctor gave me male hormones. He thought that I was, I didn't have enough testosterone in my body, so he gave me male hormones. And my parents forced me to take it. So for three days I was taking it and I felt suicidal. So I threw it off. And then I told my parents, take me to a psychiatrist. So they took me to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist actually <coughs> recommended me, recommended my parents that I should be taken to a mental health center. So I was taken to a mental health center and for one month I was put in the mental health center. It was peaceful for me. I mean, it was it was away from the everyday struggles that I was going through. There were people in the hospital who were trying to listen. Somebody was first time listening to me. My psychiatrist was listening to whatever I was speaking. And that was something that was healing to me. So there was someone who would listen to my heart, my story. That was so important, you know. I, I don't know if they understood. Uh, my struggle, but at least they had uh, their ears to listen to me. That was so important. And the doctors couldn't do anything. I mean, I was not ill, so there was no treatment. So doctors couldn't give any kind of a medicine or ointment or treatment, nothing at all. For one month I was there and then he told my parents. He told my parents that I will be okay. Just trust in me. The doctor actually said that. I actually spoke to the doctor previously. Please give good words, positive words to my parents and I will make sure that my parents will be proud. And the doctor was very helpful. He said exactly the same things to my parents. So my parents kind of trusted me. That was the beginning of my, my journey as a woman and my freedom to be the person. I always wanted to be. After my 12th grade, I was, I had to go to a college, which was another kind of a series of discrimination stories. I was put into a hostel, which was, which had mostly male students, and I was ragged severely for the first two months. I was ragged severely to the extent of stripping me also. So I endured all that. Because I had no self devil or doubt about myself. I know who I was. Yes, I was I'm in a male body, but I'm a woman. And my I have to respect myself first. My femininity needs to be respected. My womanhood needs to be respected. My gender needs to be respected. Even if a thousand people tell me that I am abnormal or I'm less than ordinary or I have, I'm sick, mentally retarded or something. For me, it was important that I respect myself. I accept myself. So I kind of accepted myself and I endured all the pain and struggles that I, that was put upon me in college too. In hostel that I was staying with the main students, out of the 70 students, at least 45 people were abusive to me. And I did not, I was not afraid of that. I did not run away from that. I faced it courageously. I wanted to fight, but in a very, not like voicing out or physically fighting with them, cursing them. I didn't want to do it. I went to an office, uh, I went to a typewriting institute. I typed all their names, the 45 names of those guys. At midnight in the hostel, I kind of broke the notice board 
and I stuck those 45 names and I locked the notice board and threw off the key. So I wrote in the list, these were the guys who abused me and I wrote all the 45 names in that. And the next day, the whole college went crazy. And I was thinking that, okay, at least three or four of these guys who actually were in the list would come and beat me up or thrash me, but none of them had the, none of them were free to do this. Because they were all guilty, and I was not. They were all wrong, I was not. And that was the end of all the stigma and discrimination and violence I went through. Because I voiced. I stood up for myself. I voiced for myself. I had the courage to do it. And that was the beginning of my activism too. As a, as, as a teenager, I had also witnessed one of my best friends who was a transgender woman. She was abandoned by her family. And she was doing sex work. And she was HIV positive. One day when I was walking through a dark lane with her, suddenly two, two auto rickshaws, the three-wheeler cars that we call as auto rickshaws, suddenly two auto rickshaws came by and seven men in those, in, in those auto rickshaws. And they pulled her inside. They pulled her inside and they kidnapped her. And I was terrified. She was screaming and nobody could help her. I mean, nobody was there to help her. I was a 12 to 13 year old kid, I remember. And then I went running home, I, I didn't tell my parents what happened. That night I couldn't sleep, I was crying all night. And early morning at 6 o'clock, I ran back to her home, it was locked. In a few minutes she came back, walked limping, couldn't walk. Her sari was torn, her face was all the nail marks on her face. She was raped by seven men the whole night. And then I, I, I cried, she cried, and I told her, let's go to the police and give a complaint. And she said, no. The police would point at me that I'm a transgender, that I'm a sex worker. They would not arrest those guys or take any action. These were some of the lessons to me as an activist, as a child, as a human being, as a transgender person. I understood right from a young age what kind of a life situation people like me go through. And for people who are not educated and poor, it's even worse. At least I was a middle class family and my parents put me in a good school. I got educated, I had the courage to voice out. For those, not only in India, around the world, whether it's in Africa or Asia, Indonesia, or South America or in the United States, or in Canada, or in Iceland, or in UK, or in Germany, are in Malta. It is the same story. We are all discriminated for who we are. The irony is being gender non-conformative or being a transgender is not wrong. It has been there since ages, since human evolution. There are at least 127 species that could be androgynous, that could be homosexual. That's nature, that's nature's diversity. We all know the earthworm, which is so helpful, especially for the agricultural lands. I mean, it, it produces, its excrements is used as a manure in Asia, the earthworm. And it has both organs, male and female, and it can reproduce itself. Isn't that wonderful? It isn't, isn't that cre little creature was a gift by God for us, for, the, for all of us, for the earth? And that is, that 
that gender diversity, isn't that beautiful to be somewhere in between a male or a female? We have black and white and why not all the colors? Colors make it so beautiful. Colors make a painting beautiful. So what if my gender falls not this extreme of a man or not this extreme of a woman? Can't I contribute in a positive way for this country? Can't I give love to human beings? Can't I take care of the homeless? Can't I give at least a penny to a beggar on the street? Can't I smile at a child who wants some love on the street? Can't I adopt a child? Can't I marry? Can't I be a human being? I can be all of this. So what if my gender is different? So what if I am a less masculine and more feminine or more masculine or less feminine? Or less feminine and less masculine or more feminine and more masculine? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. What really matters is how human I am. What values I have what I bring to our society, what I bring to our country, what I bring to our beautiful earth. I ask all of you, are we living in a healthy world? Are we living in a healthy society? <laughs> what is wrong with that? I ask you heterosexual, a lot of heterosexual people. Have we changed the earth into a heaven? We haven't. There are problems 100 years ago, there were problems 2000 years ago, there are problems now. And why is that? Because we look at everything in a very, very narrow-minded way. Religion, or gender, or sex, or race, or color. Everything, we put it in a cubicle and we think about it. So what I'm brown or black in color, my blood and your blood is the same. My emotion for love and your emotion for love is the same. My need for love and romance and security and your need for love and romance and security is the same. I was also born in a, in, in a mother's womb. And as a child, I also had dreams. I also had dreams, and like you, like you all. And thousands of transgender people like me, all of us had dreams. We don't want to be, we never wanted to be laughed at. We went, never wanted to be thrown a stone at us. We never wanted to be stigmatized. We never wanted to be laughed at. Every human being in this world deserves respect. In spite of them being a black or a white or a brown or an Asian or a Hispanic or disabled, transgender, gay, bisexual, intersex, everybody needs respect and everybody needs dignity. And does our world really give that respect and dignity and space for all of us folks? Not at all. All the religious books in this world, whether it's Bible or Quran or Bhagavad Gita, they all talk about love. They all talk about understanding. They all talk about human values, unity, dignity. But we politicize even the holy books. We value even those according to what we want it to be. And this is what has been going on for centuries. It is so easy to love another human being. I entered this evening to this amazing place and everyone smiled at me. You don't even know that what religion I belong to. You don't even know my age. You don't even know. 
Which part of the world I come from? Maybe India, yes. But from where? You don't know. But we are all here to listen to each other, to open our hearts, to understand each other, to believe and have trust and loyalty in each other. That is what God wanted us to be. Today, when I was a child, I went through a lot of discrimination and even today, it hasn't changed much. 15 years or 20 years, it hasn't changed our education system, whether it is in, the, in India or in the United States or in Africa, in an underdeveloped or a developed or a developing country, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed at all. Are we teaching our kids about gender diversity? And how far have we taught them to value human beings on their character, talent, on their knowledge and wisdom, rather than their appearance, their gender identity or sexual orientation? What are we teaching them? It, the first thing that we need to teach our children is about moral values, is about love, is to respect each other in spite of our, our differences in color, our differences in religion, our differences in caste, our differences in gender. This is what we have to teach around the world, in India or United States or in Uganda or in Iceland or in Venezuela or Cambodia. That is that will that will what will make the world a very healthy place. If we want our children to be open-minded, loving, if we want our earth to be surviving, healthy, producing young people, producing generations of people who would change this earth into a beauty, who would revive all that, that has been destroyed. What is so important is to teach our children to first respect the other human being next to you. Not to judge them for their age, for their color, for their sex or gender or religion or caste. But how far are we teaching them? We, we are failing in that. The whole education system around the world is failing in that. We need to change all that and I believe that one person can make a big change. One person can make a big change. We all believe that I'm just one person. What kind of a change can I make in this big country? We can. We all can. If Abraham Lincoln can make a change, if a Mahatma Gandhi can make a change, if Nelson Mandela can make a change, if Princess Diana can make a change, then we all can make a change too. We all can. As a child, as I told you, in, in schools, I have gone through a lot of troubles. And that actually led me to write a book. This book. It's just 20 pages. It's in Tamil. It's called Palinam Urdi Partha Elada Manavar Patri Asarir Kanaka Yedar. <laughs> this actually means that a teacher's guide to gender non-conforming students. A teacher's guide to gender non-conforming students. It's only like 20 pages. It's an information booklet. If my teacher had a booklet like this, I wouldn't have gone through all those discrimination. If each and every teacher in our country, in India or in the United States, has that access to this knowledge about gender, diversity, gender non-conformity, and has the heart to read it, to open it and read it, to understand it. We would have a healthy school. All the gender non-conforming children, all children, will have healthy friendships. We wouldn't see the transgender.